Chapter 20 The Second Plague Exodus chapter 8 verses 1 to 15 And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, or have this honour over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearken not unto them, as the Lord had said. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. The modern mind is so schooled in the fictions of naturalism that it rejects at once all that contradicts these myths. When, in the 1940s, I worked among the Paiute and Shoshone Indians, I was confronted by things I could not understand. Their older Shoshone medicine men had a knowledge of the properties of plants which was amazing, but they also had recourse at times to things which I could not account for naturalistically and came to recognise in time as supernormal and demonic. Modern man has pushed such phenomena out of his world only to have it recur among his children with the rise of occultism and Satanism. The Egyptian world had a kind of resemblance to this, but a curious one. A naturalistic worldview is compatible with occultism and Satanism. Having a non-creationist perspective, it sees power as coming from below, not from above and hence it is alert to subterranean sources of power. The volcano of power is below, its human expression is at the apex of power, and that apex is the expression of the underworld of power. We cannot understand the world of antiquity apart from this fact. In this second plague, frogs, we have again the facts of warfare by God against Egyptian faith. Frogs were associated with the goddess Hecht, or Hecate, who helped women in childbirth. Frogs were a symbol of natural fertility. Regularly and normally, frogs bred each year in abundance, 
and their role in the ecology of the earth was recognized and honored. The goddess Hecates was portrayed as a woman with a frog's head who gave life to her husband's progeny fashioned out of the chest of the earth. The worship of fertility was basic to the religions of antiquity and has been a persistent undercurrent in history. In terms of faith, the meaning of life is seen not in God, but in children. As against this, a will to death becomes a hatred of fertility as expressed in abortion and homosexuality today. In the one instance, personal fertility replaces God as the focus of life and in the other, the war against God becomes suicidal and murderous. At the command of Moses, the rod of Aaron deluges Egypt with frogs, frogs in their homes, beds, climbing on their persons and leaping into their food. The Egyptian wise men were able to produce more frogs, but they could not cause any to disappear. Pharaoh was thus compelled to turn to Moses and Aaron to beg for relief. Moses then prayed to God, and the frogs all died the next day. Egypt stank with their smells so that men had to collect and dispose of them. With this relief, however, Pharaoh's stubborn impenitence again took over and he refused to listen to Moses. Grant, according to Geike, noted, With the Egyptians, the Nile was in the strictest sense regarded as divine and was worshipped under a variety of names. As the bountiful Osiris and under many other divine names, the Nile was the beneficent god of Egypt, the representative of all that was good. Evil had, however, also its god, the deadly enemy of Osiris, the hated Typhon, the source of all that was cruel, violent and wicked. With this abhorred being, the toucher or sight of blood was associated. He himself was represented as blood-red, red oxen, and even red-haired men were sacrificed to him, and blood, as his symbol, rendered all unclean who came near it. To turn the Nile waters into blood was thus to defile the sacred river, to make Typhon triumph over Osiris, and to dishonour the religion of the land in one of its supremest expressions. Egypt's great asset, the natural order, had become its curse. The Nile was first turned into blood, and then produced a plague of frogs. Ola said of the plagues, The order of their succession stands in close connection with the natural course of the Egyptian year, from the time of the first swelling of the Nile, which generally happens in June, to the spring of the following year. But partly the severity of the plagues and partly their connection with the word of Moses make them signs of Jehovah's power. In them the triumph of the true God over the gods of the land, 12 verse 12, Numbers 33 verse 4, is shown, and thus they serve as a pledge of the triumph of the divine kingdom over heathenism, Compare Exodus 15, verse 11, 18, verse 11. Even in the heathen accounts of the departure of Israel from Egypt by Manetho, Josephus 100, Appendix 126, and Diodorus, Bibloth, Book 40, Fragments, it comes undeniably that there was a great religious struggle It is true that the plagues resemble the natural succession of the year, but they also defy it. These first two plagues alone witness to that fact. After the river had been turned into blood, how could any frogs have survived and bred in it? Later plagues similarly defy a naturalistic logic. The Nile as a source of life was slighted by scientists less than three centuries ago in defending their idea of spontaneous generation. One writer asked disbelievers to 
Go to Egypt, and there you will find the fields swarming with mice begot of the mud of Nilus, to the great calamity of the inhabitants. The frogs entered the houses, polluted the food, invaded the beds and climbed onto the legs of the people. The Egyptians saw the frogs as a symbol of fertility, but not as anything to fondle. No more than present-day champions of the rattlesnake want such snakes in their homes or yards that the Egyptians want contact with frogs. The ancient Egyptians were notable for their emphasis on cleanliness, and this plague was distressing for all. Sleep would also have been difficult. The Egyptian frog is known to science as the Rana Mosaica and is described as peculiarly repulsive and peculiarly noisy. The Egyptians were obviously miserable and resentful, and Pharaoh impotent in his anger. It is very important to remember that the plagues on Egypt were followed by God's judgments on Israel in the wilderness and later. To receive God's blessing and deliverance and then to be ungrateful is to invoke judgment. According to Asaph in Psalm 78 verses 34 to 57, When he slew them, they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouths, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness, and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Ah, he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their incense unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with heel, and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail, and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble, by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence, he smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely, so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to the border of a sanctuary, even to this mountain which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them, and divided them in inheritance by line, and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God, and kept not his testimonies, but turned back, and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. Similarly today, churches and nations expect God's providential care to continue as in the past, despite their covenant-breaking ways. According to Samuel Clark, the frog was regarded as a symbol of regeneration. Animals or insects which changed form, that is, egg to tadpole to frog, such as the frog, the butterfly and others were common symbols of regeneration. Now this symbol had become a curse and a mark of degeneration. 
There is a grim irony in these plagues. Our Lord declares, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6 verse 21 God strikes at the false securities and treasures of men with his judgments 